Nehemiah. You guys are probably familiar with uh, the story of Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah was a, um, one of God's servants. He was uh, the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And uh, he was an individual uh, whom the Lord had, uh, had called, placed his hand upon, and has subsequently deployed uh, to, uh, to rebuild the, the walls um, in the city of Jerusalem that had been breached and torn down. And, uh, and if I can tell you one of the things that I've gained a greater appreciation of and for um, in this past year, I've always appreciated, but even more so in this past year, um, has been leadership, courageous leadership, right? Because times of chaos and crisis um, and turmoil requires competent, uh, capable, uh, you know, and confident and courageous leaders to be able to chart the course or forge a path that, that other people are too maybe afraid to forge or they don't know how to forge, they don't know what to do. And Nehemiah is a picture and an example of one of these kinds and types of leaders. Um, as I stated before, I mean, how many of you guys have never, you, you familiar with the story, the story of Nehemiah? Where, uh, you know, walls in the Old Testament um, represented security. Um, just like in the story of Jericho and, the, and uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't breach the city because uh, the scripture says in, um, I believe it's in, what is that, in Joshua, Joshua 6, I believe that story is, it says that the city was straightly shut up. It was, it was walled, it was a walled in city. And, uh, and, it was, and walls represented security and safety and, and comfort and assurance, right? If you knew the, the, the thicker your wall, the higher the wall, uh, the more protection uh, that, that, you, that you ultimately had. And so it was a great, um, it was a great uh, issue when uh, Nehemiah, we're going to just read a few verses here, Nehemiah 1, when uh, Nehemiah uh, poses a question to uh, uh, one of his brothers, a gentleman by the name of Hanani, concerning asking, he was inquiring about the condition of the city of Jerusalem, and they brought back a really, really bad report uh, concerning, uh, concerning Jerusalem. So we're going to read this real quick, and I'll just share a few, few thoughts in our time together this morning. So Nehemiah 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, uh, says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them, this is Nehemiah talking, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who, who survived the exile? And, concern, and he also asked them concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, uh, the remnant there in the, province, in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Uh, if you go on to read verses uh, after verse 4, verses 5 and beyond in uh, the first chapter of Nehemiah, uh, he writes this very heartfelt prayer um, that he has prayed, that he's praying um, to God, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one of the things that uh, Nehemiah exemplifies as he's writing out this prayer uh, in a very courageous, to me, very courageous and compassionate manner is he um, he's, stands in the gap with the true heart of an intercessor and really begins praying that God would forgive their sin, their individual sin, their corporate sin, which was um, the catalyst for uh, Jerusalem being invaded and for these walls being breached in the manner that they had been breached in. And at the end of that prayer and, and then on into uh, the second chapter, uh, the, the scripture says that Nehemiah, his whole face was, um, he was wearing his emotions on his face. And the king that he served as the cupbearer, the cupbearer, their job was to uh, take wine uh, that, that uh, the staff would pour, make sure that there was no poison in it, and then they would serve that to the king. The king had confidence that he could drink what was ever in the cup based on uh, the confidence that he had in his cupbearer. 
And so the king asks, uh, asks him in uh, chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, you know, Nehemiah, why is your face looking the way that it is? You know, why does your countenance look so low and so sad? And Nehemiah begins to articulate to him, he said, it's because of the city of his fathers, referring to Jerusalem, and the condition that the city was in and how the walls had been breached and had been torn down, and he felt compelled to do something about it. And it's a very, very moving, very riveting story, particularly the, uh, the earth, these earlier chapters. And, uh, and as I was reading, as I was reading um, this story, reading, uh, you know, kind of trying to capture the sentiments of Nehemiah's heart, I couldn't, I couldn't help but to make the correlation between the walls that were breached in Jerusalem and the walls that are breached in like the local church today. Uh, the church today, and I'm not making reference to life change, I'm just talking about the church overall as a whole, and I'm not talking about the church uh, pre -pandem uh, post-pandemic. You know, a lot of the issues that have been pervasive in the local church um, have happened way before coronavirus kind of shut down everything, and they've been issues that I really believe um, grieve the heart of God. Um, you have, for example, I've heard, I don't know how many more stories I can actually hear of pastors, uh, men, male and female, but particularly it seems like the stories that I've come across um, are male figures um, who have taken advantage of the people that they've been entrusted to right their soul, they've been, you know, the, the oversight of their soul, they've taken advantage of them uh, spiritually, they've taken advantage of them financially. Uh, the scripture calls it in, um, I think it's in Ezekiel 34, he calls it fleecing the sheep. It's a very serious and egregious sin in the sight of God. Uh, when leaders take their, their spiritual prowess and they use it to their own advantage and gain um, over people's lives that they have charge over. Um, I've also seen, you know, uh, these, you know, pastors, alleged or so-called leaders or pastors uh, not only take advantage of their parishioners uh, financially, but also sexually. Um, I've seen that, and I've seen that go the other way, where there have been some people um, who, whom the Lord has given the pastor charge over, and they try to proposition the pastor um, in, a, in a sexual capacity, right? Just, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, folks just married. I'm talking about, uh, you know, single people, right? I'm talking about something, you know, just completely inappropriate, um, or you have uh, today where you have believers, particularly in an American context, uh, not so much in a global context, but definitely America, uh, where you have um, believers, particularly along black and white lines, black and white, you know, uh, groups. And when I say race, I don't believe that there's different races. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches one race is the human race, and there's different ethnos. Ethnic groups, that's the word when you see nations in the New Testament, it's the Greek word ethne or ethnos, right? And refers to different ethnic groups that constitute or make up the human race. But I say black race, white race for the sake of conversation because people are familiar with that terminology. And uh, But you see black and white believers um, who draw strong uh, allegiances uh, to American uh, political parties and American politicians and they vilify and denigrate uh, each other in public spaces to the chagrin of a world that's looking on. John said this, that, the, that how will we know that we belong to Christ is by the love that we have for one another, not by your political pre preference or persuasion. Because can I tell you, y'all, listen, there is no righteousness in the Republican or the Democratic Party. And if you believe that to be true, you are deceived, my brother and my sister. Amen. Grossly deceived and grossly misled. Thank God for governmental leaders and the roles that they serve in. But they don't care about you. They don't care about you. Y'all know, y'all, listen, we're not that slow. We know that, right? I've seen people over the course of the past 14 to 18 months fall out of relationship with people that they personally know defending politicians that they don't know. And it'd be one thing to do that in private, right? Because you know we'll never all agree on everything, right? It's one thing to do that in private. It's a whole other thing when you do that publicly. 
And when the scripture teaches that, that the world would know that we belong to Christ because of the love that we have for one another. And you see this, walls down. <laughs> Hallelujah. You've seen believers who in times past understood that when the, when the scripture calls unclean, it's unclean. And what the scripture calls clean is clean. What the scripture calls something unholy, it's unholy. And what the scripture calls holy is holy. But now the lines have been blurred. And people that once used to take strong stances, not in an in a attitude of arrogance nor defiance, but simply because I can't change the rules. I have no authority to change what has been written and given to us. My, my, my posture is to simply obey the instruction of my father. And so if God says something is unclean, I don't have the authority to make it clean. And vice versa. But now you have believers that live that way and keep company with folk that live that way. I'm talking about, I ain't talking about the sinner. I'm talking about other believing people. Because you should be a friend to the sinner, to the, un to the unrighteous. But Paul wrote to Corinth, he said that if a brother giving reference to a Christ follower finds himself wrapped up in that context, he was talking about sexual sin, he said you shouldn't even eat with them. And not only do we eat with them, we take vacations with them. And let them watch our kids and go to the movies and the dinner together. And there's no, listen, no, you have no conviction concerning it. You have people that will, that will not even listen to their pastor. I can teach or whoever be like, hey, listen, you need, to, you need to get off social media and walk in love and stop posting stuff and causing division. And it'll go in one ear and out the next. Before they even hit the, drive out the parking lot of the church, they post it because they started a Facebook fight the night before and they can't even concentrate on the life-giving message because they, 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 they're so uh, uh, enraptured and tied up in their pride and their arrogance, they can't wait to respond. Lines been blurred, walls down. Breaches. All in the wall of the church. In the same way that Nehemiah wept over the condition of his city, is I believe the same way that Christ is weeping over the condition of his bride. You have, for many people, church is optional. I'm not talking about because they have a crazy schedule and, you know, they got a job, you know, something demanding that, you know, prevents them from uh, being consistently and regularly in the house of God. No, it's just I don't feel like going today. So they are once an eight-week Christian. Once a 12-week. And then they get into crisis and they want to call the preacher. But we talked about that and taught on that six weeks ago. So if you hadn't done your due diligence and had your butt in the house of the Lord, or at least got on the archive broadcast, you could implement the word of God in your life and stop the self-deception that's taking place. Because that's what the scripture said, that if you hear the word and don't do it, you deceive yourself. And you have people who don't even care. They don't even care, Lauren, Lomo. They don't even care. That's my new name for her. I gave her that name the other night, Lomo. Hey, Lauren Moore, it's Lomo. <laughs> don't care. Don't care about. I remember a time where people cared about the church. Yeah. <laughs> cared about the bathroom smelling like pee. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on. Cared about being at all night shut in. And cared about attending Sunday school and Sunday morning service. Went out to eat afterwards, knowing you had evening service. They cared then. Don't care now. 
cared about being in choir or worship team rehearsal on Thursday, midweek service on Wednesday night, youth service on Friday night. They care. They care. They don't care no more. Church don't have value to them. And then what happens when you have an issue like a pandemic that comes and shuts down the corporate expression of the body of Christ? Now everybody goes, oh, I miss church so bad. No, you didn't. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> oh, folks, you say you're a lying wonder. No, you don't. You don't miss it because you, when you had the opportunity to be there, all the years before the pandemic, you, you, you listen, you couldn't be found. So no, you don't miss it. What's happening is the devil will you upside your head and you're in them cracked corners with that husband or wife you don't like. And you don't have no outlet because you're working from home. Now you got to school your kids from home. Everything's shut down. Now you want to be in the house of God. No, stay there. <laughs> Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know what I've been thinking about? We ain't cast no demons out in over a year. I said, you know what? I said, I know folk got all, it's going to be all kind of manifestation. We quarantine demon. Demon, what's your name? COVID. <laughs> COVID-19. <laughs> I know you came in through COVID. Come on out of there. You still got to come out. <laughs> Quarantina. <laughs> y'all know it. Y'all done worked in deliverance with this church with me for years. Y'all ain't know. I said, my God. I said, let me, let me start getting my, my reps here. <laughs> let me get myself together because you know what? It's about to be going down up in here. Woo! Lord told me to take six weeks off. I said, why? <laughs> six weeks off in the beginning of a year? Who does that? <laughs> Get your rest. Okay, Jesus. What you got up your sleeve? You know, Lord give you stuff like that. I'd be, I'd be like, hey, what you got? What you playing? <laughs> Hallelujah. Walls down. You know that Nehemiah's name in Hebrew means Yahweh comforts. That's what the meaning of Nehemiah's name. And I believe that the Lord couldn't have picked a better leader to lead what was deemed as an impossible task at the time. There have been other uh, individuals who had tried to rebuild the walls unsuccessfully. And then God put his hand, even Nehemiah said himself, he said, the good hand of my God is upon me. And, and in a record time, Nehemiah, he didn't build it alone, he was able to mobilize the people and he strategically placed them on different to work on different sections of the wall that had been breached and broken down and he he deployed them they had a tool in one hand y'all know this story is powerful they had a tool in one hand and a sword in the other because they understood the opposition the persecution and the, and the warfare that they would face as they were sent on this divine mission to rebuild these broken down walls. And in a record time, 52 days, Tina, once they started this task, they had rebuilt the walls that had been down for years. I believe that the Lord is raising up Nehemiahs in this hour. Male Nehemiahs, female Nehemiahs to rebuild the ruinous waste places. I'm not talking about religion or religious expressions or worship preferences. I'm talking about rebuilding the house of God in places where the walls have been breached in the local church. I believe that the Lord is doing that all over, all over this world and I'm so grateful. I was telling, we were in Houston last week at a conference and I was telling some of the pastors there, I said, God didn't send COVID-19, but he's extracting the good out of it. And one of the good things that he extracted out of it, I know for many ministers, is that many ministers, when you're called and you're gifted, you're called and gifted. You can work your gift and have no, and, and have not prayed in six months. 
ain't spent no time with God in, in the last year. Uh, you, it's just a reality because your gift, your gift works independent of your relationship with the Lord. I don't know if y'all heard it was this massive story probably about a month or so ago. One of the probably the most famous apologists uh, that, that the world has known or seen, Ravi Zacharias, who passed away last year, uh, last summer. And this huge, massive sex scandal that broke out since, he, since his death, talking about how many women he sexually took advantage of and raped and abused throughout all his travels and ministry over the course of 30 and 40 years. Y'all know how a lot of people dub Billy Graham as the greatest evangelist? Ravi Zacharias is probably the greatest apologist the world has ever seen. But I know enough about God to know that if you can, if you can do what what has been uncovered and discovered, right? We talking about uh, hyperbole. We talking about you know they've done research. His his um, the organization that he led. They're in uh, they're in a scramble mode trying to figure out. They're erasing his name from everything or whatever. It's it's really it's really it's really bad. It's really unfortunate uh, how how deceived he how many people he had deceived. Okay. And so what, it, what is crazy, one thing I know about the Lord is that I don't care how much Bible you know. If you can live in unrepentant, open sin like that, you know God with your head but not with your heart. Listen, and I think one of the greatest lessons that came out of the Ravi Zacharias scandal, which is public, all you gotta do is Google it, it's everywhere. One of the greatest lessons to me was that man, that God could use someone so greatly and lead so many people, right? Like his grace was really as an evangelist to help people who were, who were doubters or, or unbelievers to come out of that unbelief and to be moved out of darkness into the kingdom of God. One of the greatest gifts I'd ever seen in this, in this arena. But you can do all of that and end up like what Jesus talked about in Matthew 7. He said, won't there be many in that day that, will, that will, I prophesied in your name, I preached in your name, I cast out demons in your name, I've done all of these things in your name, and the Lord would say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. That's, that's crazy. The word iniquity is a Greek word Anomia or anomos it means to live above the law or live without law. We don't live by the Ten Commandments, we live by the two now. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one is just like to love your neighbor as your own self. And there's a greater measure of expectation and accountability in the Lord's sight concerning his people because the ten was external, but the two is internal. It's written on the tablet of your heart now by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when we get words from the Lord, right, we should get a lot of words about our own selves. When I was on sabbatical, I got words. I get words. I wouldn't get words by life change. The Lord was speaking to me by Warren. I was like, whoo, Jesus. And I wouldn't, and I don't run from that. I said, Lord, thank you that you speak to me. And that you don't let me, and that you don't, you don't let a person, uh, you know, uh, fall in their pride or their sin or their error. Because I can, he can leave us there. And it'd be unfortunate set of circumstances for that to occur. So I believe that the church is raising up Nehemiahs, people in this hour, right? Collective groups of people that are that are being tasked with the responsibility of building the local church again and making it strong. I'm a product of this. I'm, I am a product of the local church, y'all. I got my story. I didn't grow, y'all know my story. I didn't grow up in church. I set foot in a church two times in, in my teenage and adult life. One, I was about 14 or 15 when my daddy tricked me. He said, I take you, I need, I was, I was, I was more pleasantly plump back then. So like I take you to, I think it might have been the Flood Ruckers or something. You know, like I take you to this place and buy you a burger. And you go to church with me. And I went. And the preacher was preaching. I don't know what the preacher was preaching. But then they gave an altar call. 
And my daddy raised my hand. <laughs> Y'all, so many cuss words. Where he at? He here, he ain't here. So many cuss words went through my head that day. Snatched me out my seat and drug me to the altar. Everybody, ah! <laughs> I can't even tell you the words that's going on in my head right now. I'm bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and my pa and the pastor laid his hand on my head, prayed for me, and I listened. I saw this bright flash of light and I almost fell under the power. And God was showing me then, you're marked and you can't get away from me. It scared me, so I ain't going back. <laughs> and the second time when I went to church was when I ended up in prison for selling drugs. And so, you know, so, you know, walking, uh, you know, with the Lord and learning, um, you know, about him, learning how to hear his voice and, uh, and things of that nature, Getting out of prison, going to you know, going to the local church, trying to rebuild my life after you know having been in trouble, and so most of the things that I learned about manhood, fatherhood, so on and so forth, I learned in the church, or from people in the church, or from exposure relationships in the local church. How to follow the Holy Spirit? How to, you know, what I'm saying? How to buy a house? How to do in the church? Y'all, I'm a, I'm a, I have a high school education. I'm in college right now trying to get my bachelor's and my master's. I'm doing a dual program. And when I talk to certain pastors, when I travel and I preach or I lead certain courses or workshops or seminars, they're like, oh, yeah, what a great preacher. What uh, school you went to? I'd be like a hard knocks. <laughs> I got a bachelor's in a neology, neology 101, not theology. Neology 101, where I learn certain things through prayer and my submission to leadership. Neology, bending the knee. And those that to whom the Lord were humbles, the Lord will exalt you and he'll raise you up. Now, all these years later, I'm going back to school to get the degrees. So I know the value that the local church has, but it can be detrimental if the walls are down. The church is supposed to provide comfort, security, uh, rest, safety for people. Not judgment. Come on, because y'all, listen, truth be told, y'all, listen, y'all remember when y'all first got saved? Think back. Well, I, I, I've always been saved. No, you ain't. <laughs> Think back to what your life was like before you met Christ. Think back. How confused you were. The places you found yourself in. How violent you were. How depressed you were. How suicidal you were. How destructive you were. How many beds you were in. I told someone recently, I said, for many of us, the Lord didn't just save our soul, he actually can rescue us. He saved our lives and our souls. And that was able to happen because somebody loved you, prayed for you, and once you came to faith, led you to somebody's local church so you could be taught the ways of the Lord. And then what happened is, you know, like my grandma would say, your britches would get too big. You start learning certain things. You learn a little Greek, come on. Learn a little Hebrew. You ride around, you got Yahweh on your license plate. I hope they don't got Yahweh on their plate. <laughs> Judah, I'm from the tribe of Judah. You got Judah on your plate. Have kids, you start to name them Shadrach, Meshach. And the, all your kids got Hebrew names. Come on, you, you say, say now. I ain't got time for that now because, you know, I'm about my ministry. You, you doing all this, you ain't got no ministry. About my ministry. About my ministry. What's your ministry? Huh? 
Okay. Hi. We'll talk about that later. I believe that our ministry is building God's house. Some of you all will be sent away from here, right, to build his house. You complete your time or your tenure here. So some of you that have five-fold calling, you'll be sent away. I was talking to Pastor Kevin uh, last week, and, and uh, they, they're in the middle of a building. They've been in Wisconsin two years. He was on staff, one of our associate pastors. We sent him away two years ago. He, he wasn't in there six months. And somebody walked in. He pastors a smaller church. And somebody walked in and dropped a $100,000 check. Did they ministry? They, they, they church seat about 40. They just bought a building cash in a pandemic. He was telling me he was like, Apostle, I don't know. And all this is going on. And we starting to renovate. We started the renovation this week. And. We only had so much money. We needed about another 20000 to do the work. And I said, well, what did the Lord say? The Lord told me. I met with our board. And, I, and they said, move forward. And they ain't had the money. So they started moving forward with the demo of the building. Somebody met him at his church on Tuesday. gave him a check for 10000 and, and that person introduced him to somebody else. The next day, gave him a check for 25000 <laughs> But you know where he was when I met him some years ago? About to move to Egypt. And that wasn't his assignment. And when we met, I talked to him, I said, you're not a missionary. I know you don't want to hear this. You're a pastor. Oh. <laughs> All right. So we'll just make you the director of the missions ministry right now to warm you up to the idea. But that's why, that's why the door closed. You ain't supposed to be in Egypt. You're supposed to be right here in America. And look at him now, knocking it out the park. Look at Mike. And you, you know what I'm saying? So some of you will leave here. But when you leave here, you're going to build a, the church, the church universal, somewhere, and some of y'all will go with them. Y'all got quiet. Y'all get so quiet. Because the church's number one responsibility, Sherry, is not to clothe the naked, it's not to feed the poor. You know what it is? Make disciples. Make disciples. And all of that other stuff, right, are doors that leads to God's end goal of making disciples. So if we're not making disciples, we're wasting time. Disciples are students, adherents to the teachings of Jesus. They follow him. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. And they say, yes, sir, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. That's the church's, every church. I know every church don't do that, but every church's primary responsibility it's two words, make, win the loss, and that's three words, and make disciples. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think about the people that you know in your, your circle, your family, friends, coworkers that are lost right now. Suffering with gender confusion, loneliness, People undergoing sex changes. People jumping in and out of dysfunctional relationships. All kind of abuse, depression. And you know what the solution is? The power of God. The word of God. The presence of God. That flows through the authority of the local church. You understand what I'm saying? So... We'll be talking about this over the course of the next few weeks, just you know, what is God saying to us? And we were, we found ourselves in Nehemiah's story. What's our responsibility? Amen? What's our responsibility to uh, making impact? In this church, the city, and also throughout the world. And are we willing to respond accordingly? To the Lord's obedience. I know we build you. I can't. I can't do that. People, you make time for what you, what's important to you. If you go stand in a line and sleep overnight for a raggedy TV during Black Friday, listen, let's talk about prior, misplaced priorities of Americans. You have people who will do that, right? They'll do that. 
But if it starts, we doing evangelism and it starts drizzling. Right. Right. I, you know, I just got my hair done, Apostle. Now I can't be. But you slept in a cold on a pup tent on the concrete for, for a raggedy 32 inch TV. <laughs> Hallelujah. Taking that money proudly. Come on, somebody might be your tithe money. Come on, Woody Woody. We didn't talk about that. We got to change. Then we can build the church so the church can be strong. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's stand. The scripture says, um, I think it's in Matthew, it says that the harvest is plenty, plentiful. But the laborers are few. I mean, that was happening even in Jesus' time. Isn't that something? But Jesus gave us a solution. He said, but therefore pray unto the Lord of the harvest that the Lord would do what? He would send forth laborers into his harvest. And one of the things that, um, uh, about that text, I think it's in Matthew something, Matthew 9 or something like that about that text is typically when you see the word send or sending, sender, send out in the New Testament, it's typically the Greek word, it's a compound word, apostello, it's where you get the English word apostle. It means to be sent on a mission or on an assignment like Nehemiah was. But in that text, that context when it says to you know pray unto the Lord of the harvest, which is what we're gonna do momentarily here as a, a church family, that he would send forth laborers to his harvest that word sin there is not apostello. I believe it's the word ekbalo, which means to violently thrust or throw someone from one place into the next. Why would God have to do that? Because when, when you're sent apostello, you get a word from the Lord like Isaiah, Nehemiah, and you willingly lay down your will and your life and you go. So why would the Lord tell us that we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he couldn't apostello but ekbalo, violently hurl and throw someone from the place that they are to the place where they need to be. Why do you think we, he has to, why do you think that he, they, he wrote that and why, why do you think that that is? Stubborn, fear, don't wanna go. Middle name is Jonah. I know it can be, right, frightening, just, you know, just whatever, but you know what? People's lives are at stake, y'all. Think about this. Your, your pastor is an ex-prisoner, a felon. God found me in prison, put his hand on my life and raised me up, an uneducated man to teach, train, and part and mold the educated. How many more individuals are like that in prisons, come on, on street corners, selling dope? You, you know what I'm saying? Doing all kinds of foul things to, so that Jesus can shift their life and God can use them, use their life for the rest of his life. There are individuals that are like that. Amen? So we have to, like Jesus said, open our eyes to the harvest all around us because it's, the fields are white. They're ripe for harvest, he said, and the harvest is plentiful. The labors are few. I don't ever want to be found to be one of the ones that the Lord has to twist my arm and make me do something. I told the Lord in prison years ago in 1998, I said, Lord, you saved, you saved me. Not just spiritually, like you actually saved my life from the choices I was making, from destroying my life. And I gave him a promise. I said, whatever you want me to do with the rest of my life, I'll do. I didn't know what I was doing, saying, but I, I meant it. I think about that often, Brown, where we go on planes and traveling and, you know, across the water. I'd be like, man, I told, I told the Lord. But our lives are not our own. They shouldn't be. So let's pray right now that the Lord, to the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labors and avail yourself because he might say, hey, you know what? I've been waiting on you to pray this prayer. You might be one of the labors that we're praying for. And all of us have life and things that are going on in life, but you know what? That does not exempt us from uh, proving our love to Jesus. 
You know, because you know how, you know, the sign of proving you, that you actually love the Lord, not just with lips, but with your life? And you know, what did he tell Peter? He said, Peter, do you love me? Of course, Jesus, I love you. What did he say to him? Feed my lambs. He asked him again. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. By coming to church, but by how you care for his, his people. Amen. And that's not just the pastor's responsibility. That is the corporate Christian community's responsibility. To care for, love, and walk with one another. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that, uh, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And, and that, Lord, you speak to us. You lead us and guide us, Lord, for your great name's sake. And uh, Lord, we ask and we pray today. You instructed us in your word to pray to the Lord of the harvest. That you would send forth labors into your field of harvest. And Lord, there are men and women, even in this room, Lord, whom you have called. Uh, your hand, Lord, like it was upon Nehemiah. Your, your hand is upon them. And you're calling them, Lord God to rebuild the broken down areas uh, in the local church that have existed for some time. Lord, I pray for all of us that if there's areas in our hearts that are unyielding, that are unsubmitted, not submitted to you properly, Lord, that you would reveal those things and that, Lord, you would give us the confidence and the courage, uh, Lord, like, like our elder brother Christ, said in Gethsemane when he said Lord if it's possible let this cup pass from us pass from me but nevertheless Lord not my will not my will let your will be done through my life because I believe Lord that you uh, are mobilizing your people uh, in this time Lord to give their lives so that other people's lives can be impacted I pray, Lord, we pray that you would help us to upgrade the way that we view and see ourselves. Um, God, that we would not just run off on a tangent, but that, no, Lord, we would be genuinely led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that you would, uh, you would guide us. That you would, um, that you would, you would instruct us. That you would guard us. And that, Father, you would give people like me, myself, and my wife, and and other, Lord, uh, senior set leaders in other churches across the country, around the world. The spirit of Nehemiah, the vision of Nehemiah, Lord God, to mobilize the saints, Lord, to, to rebuild, Lord, the old waste places, places that have been found to be in ruins uh, because of our own disobedience, uh, Lord, our own sin, Lord God, the, the rebellion that comes from uh, um, the generation in which we live. Lord, give us that spirit, Lord, to, to identify the needs shoot the gaps and fill those needs to, to, to strategically place, set families upon the walls. Um, Father God, like Nehemiah did, Lord, give us wisdom concerning that. Open our eyes to see things from your perspective and not our own. We honor you and we bless you and we pray, Father, this afternoon for, Lord, our wayward sons and daughters, our nephews, our nieces, our cousins, our relatives, aunts, uncles, Lord God, people that are in our families, friends that we've grown up with, co-workers that we work with, people, Lord God, that, um, Father, that, uh, that, may, that, that, that don't, may not currently live for you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the heart of an evangelist like, like Timothy in the scriptures. Uh, when Paul told him, he said, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Father, I pray that we would start in our own backyards with people that we know, Father, uh, 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 bringing them, Lord, as you lead us into places of faith. Hallelujah. And I pray that when we tire um, and grow weary as a result of, um, Lord, their, maybe their hatred or their disdain uh, for the church or for Christianity, for the things of God, Father, I pray that our lives would be um, would be healthy examples that people, Lord, can look at and say, whatever is in your life and on your life, I want that in and on my life as well. Father, help us to be uh, proper examples, Lord God, our lives to be living epistles, read of all people, and help us and help to remind us of that, 
Father God, as we carry out our lives, Lord, in our conduct and in, in how we interact with people, the things that we post or the things that we share. Holy Spirit, if there are areas uh, in our lives where conviction needs to occur, Lord, we grant you permission, uh, Father, to speak to us accordingly in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, for renewing our vigor, giving us supernatural strength, and giving us a passion, Father God, to build the local church so that people's lives can be changed forever for your glory and for their family's good. In the name of Jesus, we honor you, we bless you, and thank you for thrusting us out, Father God, according to your plan and your timing and not our own. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Somebody say amen. And amen. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.